Good morning, interweb. Let's world build. A planet's lower atmosphere is essentially a giant circulation mechanism. Its purpose? Transfer heat from the equator to the poles. Simple idea, but it gives rise to a pretty complex system, thanks in no small part to the Coriolis effect. To explain, imagine I shot a super long range gun from the equator directly northward. It should hit a target directly to the north, right? But Earth spins counterclockwise on its axis, west to east, and because the Earth is a sphere, points on the equator spin faster around its axis than points at the poles. So as the bullet leaves the gun, the greater spinning momentum is conserved, causing the bullet to veer to the right. The opposite occurs in the southern hemisphere. The bullet would, from its perspective, be deflected to the left. That is the Coriolis effect in a nutshell, more in the doobly-doo. Anyways, warm air rises at the equator, at about 12 to 15 kilometers up it hits the tropopause, the upper limit of the lower atmosphere. It then splits and begins to move poleward with the Coriolis effect deflecting it to the east. At a latitude of about 30 degrees the air is effectively moving due east, so it can never reach the poles. It cools, sinks and travels back along the surface towards the equator and westward. The deflection again being caused by the Coriolis effect. We call this structure the Hadley cell and we call the prevailing winds within the Hadley cell the trade winds. Something similar happens at a latitude of about 60 degrees. Relatively warm air rises at a height of about 8 kilometers, splits, moves poleward and eastward, sinks and returns along the surface westward. This is the polar cell and these are the polar easterlies, so called because they blow from the east. Connecting these two cells is the feral cell. The prevailing winds in this region are called the westerlies. The same structures occur in the southern hemisphere except everything is flipped, again a consequence of the Coriolis effect. Finally, the zones where each of the cells meet are called the intertropical convergence zone, the subtropical ridges and the polar fronts. Where warm air rises we get a low pressure zone and where cool air sinks we get a high pressure zone. So, to apply this to your fantasy world, simply mark in the intertropical convergence zone on the equator, the subtropical ridges at 30 degrees north and south, and the polar fronts at 60 degrees north and south. And mark in the required wind patterns. Atmospheric circulation done. Well, sort of, this pattern only holds for planets exactly like Earth. Like if your planet rotates in the opposite direction, clockwise, sun rising in the west and setting in the east, the pattern would look like this. Same deal as before, except everything is flipped. Which is cool, but we can really start to mess with the structures if we change the rotation rate. Rule of thumb here is that the slower a planet rotates, the less circulation cells it will have. To give specific examples, planets with rotation rates half, a quarter, an eighth, and one sixteenth that of Earth's will have one cell per hemisphere. Basically, this if the rotation is counterclockwise, and this if it's clockwise. Planets with 1 to 2 times Earth's rotation rate have 3 cells per hemisphere. Like before, counterclockwise, clockwise. Planets rotating 4 times as fast as Earth will have 7, this or this. Note the latitudinal values that mark where various cells begin and end. And planets rotating 8 times as fast as Earth will have 5 cells per hemisphere. This or this. Again, note the rough latitudes. Now I have no idea why planets with a 4x rotation rate book the otherwise nice linear trend, but either way, decide which rotation regime is closest to your planet and mark it in like we did earlier. And before you ask, tidally locked planets would look something like this. Day side, night side. Warm air rises at the equator on the day side. From the subsolar point powerful winds would blow eastward, while less powerful winds would blow westward. From the north and south, cool winds would blow from the poles towards the equator. Where all these winds meet, thick bands of precipitation would occur. The hottest temperatures will be north and south of this zone due to the lack of moderating cloud cover. The east side will be warm and wet, whilst the west side will be cooler and drier. And on the night side, the region around the anti-subsolar point will be very cold and very dry, whilst the rest of the hemisphere will be a little less extreme. Here it is in 3D if you're having problems visualising it. Now to be clear, all these circulation regimes are oversimplified. Planets have pressure centres, change over time and are influenced by the configuration of continents. If you want to achieve something this accurate, check out the doobie doo. Personally, I think roughly knowing what's going on in your world is more than sufficient. Regardless, what's the point? Why do all this? So as we saw with the tidally locked examples, atmospheric circulation plays a role in determining wind patterns, precipitation and ultimately biome placement. But for now, I'm going to talk culture and weather. Going back to a more Earth-like configuration, we can divide a world into a hot zone, temperate zones and cold zones. 
Anything that evolved in a given zone probably won't do so well in another. A Peruvian crop planted in Canada will likely die, but an Italian crop planted in Iran or Japan, say, will probably be okay. Peru and Canada lie in different zones, Italy, Iran and Japan lie in the same zone. Same goes for animals, hence no equatorial polar bears. And people. Empires are more likely to do their empiring in zones similar to their homeland. For these reasons, Jared Diamond of Guns, Germs and Steel Infamy suggests that zonal landmasses are more likely to develop advanced civilizations because they provide a somewhat homogenous space for people to share crops and animals and acclimatize to each other's diseases. Now, to be fair, these aren't hard limits. Just ask corn or the British or any historian. Nonetheless, atmospheric circulation can play a role in the distribution of flora and fauna and civilizations. Also, where the cells meet, maritime barriers are created. Sailors used to refer to the intertropical conversion zone as the doldrums, because winds there tended to be fairly stagnant, meaning that sailors could be stuck there for days, if not weeks on end, waiting for winds to change, leading to the threat of scurvy, delirium, starvation, cabin fever, and death. Same goes for the subtropical ridges, aka the horse latitudes, so-called because sailors stuck there would sometimes throw their horses overboard to conserve water. These zones will impact how the seas are navigated on your world. Similarly, the prevailing winds will also be a factor. Like back in the age of sail, this would not have been a great route to take. A ye olde galleon would be sailing directly into the prevailing wind. Instead, getting from West Africa to South Africa meant riding the trade winds to Brazil and riding them back across the Atlantic. In terms of weather phenomena, expect tropical cyclones, think hurricanes, to form over equatorial oceans between about 5 and 20 degrees north and south on your world, and expect them to make landfall in the direction of the prevailing wind. Thunderstorms can occur pretty much anywhere where you got cold air masses moving into regions of particularly warm, moist air. The US is a great example of this. They can also occur where air moves upwards over a region with an immense supply of water, i.e. areas around the intertropical conversion zone and they can occur in mountainous regions. As for tornadoes, expect them to occur in the feral cell between about 30 and 50 degrees north and south. The feral cell can be seen as a turbulent eddy that occurs as a result of the other two cells, and as such its winds are fickle and prone to variability, perfect for getting those tornadoes spinning. Added to that, tornado genesis most often occurs in regions where warm, moist air flows at low levels and cool, dry air flows up high. On Earth, this basically only happens in the States, which is why the US receives way, way, way more tornadoes than anywhere else. And so, biomes aside, that is just about that. But let me leave you with a cool weather-based bit of geofiction. Imagine we took Mordor, scaled up the Sea of Nurnan, and made it an estuary spilling out into an equatorial ocean. This basically hits all the thunderstorm criteria from earlier. Mountains, and lots of them, check. Tropical location, check. Lots of moisture, check. Cold air coming in from the mountains, mingling with the warm air of the lake, check. Mix it all together and we get everlasting thunderstorms. Mordor 2.0 can expect thunder and lightning for the vast majority of its year. Each night, storms would rage for about 10 hours or so, and at peak, lightning would strike about 30 times per minute. Sounds badass, right? And super fantastical. Yeah, it's not. It happens on Earth, in Venezuela, at Lake Maracaibo. It's amazing. Earth, sometimes you make the best fantasy planet. I feel like... This black top is gonna to blend with the background a lot and I'm gonna look like a floating white head. The beacons are lit! <laughs> Good morning, interweb. Heads up, I just created a new Patreon tier that allows early access to the script, so if that sounds like a thing you'd be interested in, head into the doobly-doo. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks to the Patreons for supporting me in my nerdy endeavors. And in particular, thanks to Andrew Shahil, Isaac Silver, Robin Hilton, World Anvil, Rip to Passe, and a massive thank you and welcome goes to new Patreon, Borja de Savala Torres, whose name I probably butchered. I'm sorry. Until next time, Edgar out.